there any uh, amendments to be offered? Okay. Would somebody like to make a motion to approve them? Um, yes. I have a couple of small Go amendments. Ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, in fact, I was just talking with Leslie uh, before we started to try and clarify a couple things. Okay. Um, on the front page on line 44, um, that line says, houses even with the front persuade with the proposed porch. We think that's probably intended to mean instead of persuade, the front facade, the front facade of the proposed porch probably. I think is the best we can, the best we can determine. Okay, great. Are there others? Um, the, the only other one is just merely a, a typo. Um, on page three, line six, the end of the sentence there says, sunlight will be lost, L O should be L-O-S-T instead of L-O-S-S-E-D. Where's the grammar tick when you need it? Okay. It, it Other than that, nothing else. Yeah, I Very said, uh, same page, page three, line 25. I think limitability was intended to be livability. Yeah, yeah. And that's also on line 26. And I believe aesthetics begins with an A, A-E. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there other amendments? Okay. Would somebody like to make a motion? Accept the minutes as amended. So moved. Seconded. Any more discussion? All those in favor of the amended minutes? Opposed? Okay. Unanimous. Mm. We'll move on to old business, which is the tabled item on the appeal of Anthony Taylor, pro style designed for Ronald and Kay Kramer, 21 Island View Road. Uh, tax map U030, lot 69 for front property line, variance of 4 feet 0 inches from the required 20 feet zero inches to keep the former and porch edition. That was tabled at the end of the last meeting. Um, see that you're here. That's, that's great. Would you um, like to come forward and give us an update? Uh, last month's uh, application has been withdrawn and a new one has been substituted for it with a uh, survey. So you've, you've officially withdrawn it and submitted a new one? Yes. He hasn't officially withdrawn. He'd like to withdraw it tonight. He'd like to withdraw it now. That's correct. I have made the application for the new one. Okay. Right. Um, let's see, procedurally, what is it that we need to do now? Do we need to, it's been tabled, we can just set it aside and consider the new one. Procedurally, That's that, right? Okay. Then um, we'll um, we'll be continuing on with with new business with an explanation of your your um, new application, and that is to hear the appeal. Same information as before, but for a front property line variance of 12 feet zero inches from the required 20 feet to construct dormer and porch addition. Please update us. So uh, with the aid of this map, I would like to demonstrate the, the difference between the uh, actual appearance of the lot with some subtleties in it is the green. But the, uh, the deed itself is very brief and succinct and, and really describes the lot as being 97 and a half feet in, on one side and 97 and a half feet on the other side. The third um, segment of the uh, closed area being a quarter circle. And so the, uh, the new uh, plan corresponds to uh, the, the way it's, it is described legally in the deed. So the, the surveyor has found the uh, corner post and then described it out as illustrated in the uh, red line. The brown is the existing outline of the house and the walls. And the blue is the extent of the porch. 
as it is proposed. You say this again, the red is the... Does the green go to the street? Yes, that, that okay. is that is okay. very carefully measured how uh, far into the actual site position. Mm -hmm. And the blue represents where the porch would be. I realize what we are out to discuss tonight is uh, the uh, setback issue. And I would like, just like to point out again that in this neighborhood, several porches uh, are as close or closer to the uh, pavement of the street. So this picture over here, 8C view, is the house directly behind uh, 21 Island view. And you, as you can see, the corner of the porch, porch comes two feet closer to the pavement. And yet, though, uh, an open porch like this, not glazed and not sided, doesn't present the kind of uh, visual obstruction as a solid wall would if we are uh, concerned with uh, neighborhood aesthetics. I would say that in defense of an, an open porch. Unscreened, unglazed. Although, if we knocked off uh, one corner of the porch and merely built uh, a centerpiece, a, a doorway, and a porch on the right side, that uh, wouldn't be uh, at all ugly, I think that would be quite attractive. This is a colonial revival house, and uh, colonial revival is characterized by uh, rigid symmetry. Uh, Mr. Kramer uh, regrets that uh, due to business obligations, he is unable to attend this meeting. However, he asked me to uh, convey to you the following information. Last Sunday evening, the uh, Kramers held a reception at their house and invited all of the neighbors to meet them and look at the plants. A straw poll was taken, and at least a dozen neighbors that had seen the plants voted in favor of this addition being built. The consensus of the group was that if this variance to build a uh, colonial revival front porch were denied, then the Kramers would be, in effect, not given the opportunity to contribute to the architectural character of Island View Road. In fact, the, the costliness and most ornamental features of this renovation are on the street side. This is their gift to the street. And Mr. Kramer realizes that what was to be discussed was the, the setback issue. Not to minimize this concern, he has sought to share his intentions with his neighbors and seek their input before proceeding. And he would just like to know if the board would consider a petition of property owners in the area to be presented if this item could be uh, tabled to uh, allow enough time to, uh, to follow that uh, uh, idea through. I'm sorry, could you repeat that last statement? If we could table this or uh, continue it in the, to allow time for uh, the neighbor's sentiments to be recorded and, and presented to this uh, body in, in the form of a written uh, statement. Go on. D merely that uh, th these people in the neighborhood uh, 
would be very disappointed if this were uh, not allowed to, uh, this renovation were denied and that, uh, um, that uh, Mr. Kramer would not be able to contribute to the uh, property values and to the uh, cohesiveness of the, uh, the district by building a, an addition compatible with the uh, level of uh, detail and the character of the surrounding houses. And uh, so as a result of the meeting and uh, the reception and uh, discussion that took place, there's a great deal of interest now in the, uh, in the community about uh, what Mr. Kramer uh, wants to do. And uh, with opinions I, uh, being strong on the, on the subject, uh, they would like the opportunity to formally uh, present to you uh, a summary of neighborhood opinion about this matter. Thank you. Is there any other information that you'd like to present to us before we engage in a discussion? Well, I don't know if it's if I ought to go over everything I went over last time, or uh, whether that's treading over old ground, or whether uh, I just wanted to present the new information based on, uh, um, Mr. Kramer has a company and he has to work all around different parts of the country, and uh, in a way, uh, he, he was able to have this meeting because he happened to be here uh, last weekend and uh, in, in an interest to find out. And uh, it's interesting, you know, that the person would, would take the time to want to find out what the neighbor, neighborhood thinks about. Uh, in addition, a lot of people would just say, hey, you know, it's my house, you know. So I, I think that's, that, that is a, uh, some uh, reflection of uh, type of person Mr. Kramer is. And it, uh, that uh, he wanted to open it up to uh, opinion and, and see if this was something the uh, neighborhood would welcome. And, uh, that, that to me is an, an attitude you don't always find in the experiences I've had. And it seems to me that this, this type of body is should be more concerned with people who, who laugh at neighborhood opinion rather than consulting. So, uh, <coughs> so I just wanted to simply uh, present this information and uh, not elaborate unduly. So okay. thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd like to re respond to that just to, just to be um, very clear and succinct about it. At the last meeting, the um, with the measurements, you were asking for a four-foot variance from the required 20 feet for the setback. This is a, uh, require, a, a request for 12 feet uh, from the 20 feet required um, is, is what your request is now, which is, with these new measurements, more of a variance requested yes, than the original correct, one. Yeah. yeah. The dilemma of, of this zoning board is that we have the undue hardship language in our ordinance, which has four conditions that, that we need to see that are met in order to grant a variance. And much of the discussion at the last board meeting um, hinged around those and that interpretation. And last evening there was more discussion with it in a town council workshop about the, um, a proposal for an amendment of, of those for to convert it to a practical difficulty, which would take into consideration more the um, situation in the neighborhood. Um, but tonight, we are under the current ordinance language, which is undue hardship, which has four conditions in it. Um, and there were, there were concerns at the last meeting about whether this would, regardless of the merits of this proposal, whether it meets those conditions that would allow us to grant a variance. And I think that our discussion now on the board and, and our questions for you, and I'll open it up for, for discussion and questions, needs to clarify that. Sure, yeah. So I'll, uh, Mr. Keneally, would you like to? Yeah, I, uh, at the last meeting, we were, we complimented your design a great deal, and I think your design is uh, aesthetically very pleasing. <coughs> and I, I certainly applaud Mr. Kramer's willingness to open his door to the neighbors and listen to the neighbors' opinions. 
Um, but you should know the board does not make its decisions based on opinions of anyone. This board has to make its decisions based on fact planning against certain fixed criteria. Um, and the problem would be even if we had the new set of standards in place that we discussed last night at a workshop, that new set of standards does not allow a variance that would bring any part of a structure closer than 10 feet to a property line. So even with a different set of standards, this application could not satisfy those standards. With the current set of standards, despite the fact that I think we admire both the design and the attitude of Mr. Kramer, it's, it's impossible, I think, for us to say that this land does not yield a reasonable return without a variance. And my own feeling at this point would be that I would have to suggest or recommend that you go back to redesign this so that it's more in conformance with the current setback requirements. And I, I really feel uncomfortable saying that because I think Mr. Kramer has approached us in a very forthright way, approached the neighbors in a forthright way, brought forth a good design. But our job as a zoning board is to uh, make sure that property is not too intensively developed. And once you get this close to the property line, eight feet away, by any set of standards, it's, it's too intensively developed. <clears throat> Mr. Pistacci? You think I have a question, do you? Um, you showed us a map with green and red on it. What was submitted in the application? Is that the red line or is it the green line? It's the red line. It's the red line, so it's the more restrictive one? Yes. Okay, fine. That's all right. That's, that's fine. Um, still in this application, um, I don't see what percent of the lot will be covered. Um, and that's still an issue that I had from, uh, from the previous application. Um, there's no reference to uh, the garage being torn down. Bruce, what is the percentage? 25% cannot be covered by a dwelling? Footprint cannot be greater than 25%? 25% of the lot can be covered by buildings. Right. That's correct. Mm -hmm. The figures, like I said before, the figures worked out um, to less than 25% for this addition. With or without the garage in place? I would have to review them. Yeah. But, but it's See, obvious that the garage is going, so, I mean, it's... Okay, it's but I, I didn't have that information uh, to review when, when I received this packet, and it's still, it's still is an issue. I don't see anywhere where it says the garage is going to be torn down, so I'm, I'm looking at the overall picture that the garage is still there. Um, and, but it's still, it's still greater than what you were asking for last month, and there was a lot of concern about what you were asking for last month. I mean, this is a... Uh, a tremendous increase. Your application said that it's only the uh, a, a portion of the porch that will be um, see, which brings only the left corner of the proposed front porch beyond the street setback limit. Um, I took a compass and drew it, and it looks like it's going through more than the uh, the corner of the of the porch it looks like it's going through the uh, front stairs the whole the front stairs are included in it and a portion of the house is included in the uh, uh, the 20 foot setback so I think there's a lot more in the in, in the 20 foot setback than you really realize and and this is what I have a hard time with well that, that is correct I it was an oversight of why not to uh, put this on the uh, map but I we do have a building permit uh, for the de demolition of the garage. And I am also aware that uh, more of the, the structure is, uh, falls within that, uh, that zone. And uh, I, I, would, I would offer a possible uh, you know, solution to that, to uh, delete the left-hand part of the porch completely, just leaving the, uh, the central entrance and the uh, right-hand porch. That is the type of, I think, direction that we would go in if uh, we would so direct it. It would, it would 
bring it more within the range of, of what we thought we were dealing with last, uh, last meeting, where it looked like um, uh, eight feet, maybe. I, th I think that just, that just that would still be an attractive design, so we might consider that. What's the what's depth of the porch? Uh, eight. Eight feet? Because Mr. Versace's uh, or Jack's uh, statement that that with the new practical difficulty, the board won't be able to have the opportunity to grant anything less than ten. Yes. Um, you might want to consider if that passes. If you squeeze your ports, you could always go back to the board and approach them under that standard. Um, that we, we don't know that's going to pass, but. You should, you should have that in the back of your mind, that, that that's a possibility. Are there other questions from the board members? Yeah, just, just one more and then I'll listen. Um, the first item, um, hardship. You've touched about aesthetics and, and other people in the neighborhood and it won't uh, interfere with the characteristics of the neighborhood, but the hardship, you kind of danced over that one. And I was wondering if you could uh, explain a little bit more to us the, the hardship that uh, Mr. Kramer is going to experience if we deny this, this application. Well, the, uh, the hardship is just a discrepancy between the present condition of the dwelling and the type of house that uh, Mr. Kramer uh, envisions having. And uh, just for starters, in the, on the, on the top floor where the master bedroom suite is, uh, uh, no front window, and uh, it's just a dark with slanted ceilings, and uh, the nice dormer idea would, would open it up and uh, will eliminate a lot of that uh, hardship. The, uh, as I explained last week, the added height that you'll get with the, the central dorm, particularly because the uh, building jogs out around the front entrance the way it does, it would, it would, it would give it an ungainly, awkward appearance from the outside. Aesthetics, which is where the, uh, the front entry, the way it staggers up, uh, breaks out, and uh, some nice columns, uh, that would soften the outline and, and uh, balance out the extra height with uh, something lower and more spread out. And, uh, well, I, I feel that if this were denied in, in its entirety, something more modest could be done that might achieve many of the same ob objectives. But still, something's needed to, uh, to, to balance it out aesthetically, just to stick a, a big tower up, up on the front of a house and uh, leave it there, it's sort of awkward. So uh, the whole por the porch idea was, and, and then again, you know, uh, the very idea that he, Mr. Kramer has spoken of, that he wanted a front porch because he likes to live outside, and that tokens a great deal of uh, the neighborliness of the, the whole new urbanism, the kind of houses they're building in the seaside Florida. The, the front porch has become, you know, quite a, a staple of this movement. and. Uh, our times, our aspirations. And the architecture is an outward reflection of uh, how we wish to be perceived by our neighbors. It's a, really a form of communication. Out, quite above just what we need to be comfortable and, and to have our privacy. The other side of it is, is wanting to show a good face to the, to the, to the neighbors. Thank you. M Mr. Taylor, last uh, month I was very complimentary of your uh, design, and I remain complimentary of it, um, and I have no doubt that it would be a wonderful addition to the house in the neighborhood. Um, however, following up on Mr. Prestasi's question, um, before we can approve your request for the variance, um, we have to find that if the variance isn't granted, that the owner will suffer a, an undue hardship, which has been 
defined by the courts to mean that he, the owner will suffer a practical loss of all beneficial use of the land if the variance isn't granted. I'm troubled by that standard, and I don't think we're even close to having met that. Can you help us at all with it? I don't mean to put you on the spot and ask you the impossible. But you know that that's the hurdle that we're facing. Uh, yeah, I, I, w I would agree that uh, he's not being denied uh, all practical use of, um, to occupy the uh, property. And, uh, you know, that maybe I'm talking about uh, being denied the potential it has to be a full aversion of itself. Just like many of us who, are, who have stunted personalities are denied the potential to be our fuller selves. And a house is a reflection of a, of a person that lives in it. No, I, that's what I meant. You know, it, it's not denying the present, uh, <coughs> the use of the present facilities. It, it, it's, it cannot. Uh, in other words, work itself out. When you, when you buy somebody else's house, you, you have in mind the idea that it's going to suit you, like buying a, some clothing that needs to be altered to make it fit you and uh, to suit uh, your personality as, an, as a outward reflection of who we are, as I was, was, was saying. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. If there are no other questions of you, we'll close the public hearing part and we'll have discussion on the board. Is there anyone who wants to speak in the public? Is, is there, I'm sorry, is there anyone uh, from the public who would like to speak? It made an assumption, but thank you for making me check. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then we'll have some discussion on the board about this request. <coughs> Well, I'll pick up where I left off last <coughs> um, and I think the issue is the same and it's even more extreme with the increase in the requested variance. Um, but um, it seems to me that <coughs> there's an acknowledgement that the undue hardship uh, standard has not been met and um, under the current ordinance, I don't see that we can, we have any basis to approve this unless we're simply willing to ignore the ordinance itself. Which is something that I'm not willing to do. How do others see it? I, I would agree with that. And in fact, I, for the benefit of the applicant, I would offer my own opinion or sentiment right now that if the alternative standards were in place, I would still be reluctant to approve um, anything more than a 25% incursion into the front line setback, and therefore I would, I would be very reluctant to approve anything that would be closer than 15 feet to the front property line. Um, but with the current standards, there's no way that I can approve this, and with the new standards, I couldn't approve it either. And in fact, as I said, I want to. This is simply for the benefit of the applicant. Um, I'm feeling is that we should not go any more than 25% into the front setback as far as granting variances. But that's just one, one opinion. I agree with everything that's been said tonight and stress that even though the neighbors would like it, if I was in our na this neighborhood, I'd like the improvement. Um, that's just not a factor that I can, I'm factoring in. Nor are we permitted really to factor in under our current okay. ordinance. Um, and I just feel that the the four factors that we can factor in haven't been met in the circumstances. I think it would create a very nasty precedent if we recognize aesthetic considerations as, as a hardship, where the house does not now reflect the owner's personality, and therefore it's a hardship not to have <coughs> a house not reflecting your personality. Uh, I, I understand that, but to call that a hardship is, is so much of a stretch that I could not support a, a variance in this case. 
it, as, as we're, we're, we're sharing opinions before we put a motion on, on the table so that we have as full a discussion as we've already had a full discussion, but to make sure that it's thoroughly examined. I heard some dollar numbers last, last month, and uh, they were staggering to me. And with that amount of money spent, what's the matter of spending another $10,000 or so in moving the structure back to the corner? You know, that might sound... <laughs> Uh, extreme, but there are other alternatives, basically, and because of that, and because of the condition of the of the uh, the setting of the house, uh, uh, I agree with mm -hmm. the other comments made. Mm -hmm. Well, I I um, likewise haven't um, am, am more concerned about the increased um, depth of the the setback request, and and feel along with everyone else, that, that this does not meet the four conditions of undue hardship. Um, and it seems that we're all in agreement, but we need a motion that would do that. Who would like to offer that? I'll move that the request for a 16-foot uh, variance, uh, to a 12-foot variance be denied on grounds that the applicant has not shown that the land in question did not yield a reasonable return unless the variance is granted. Second. Is there any further discussion on that? Okay. All in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. So, Mr. Taylor, we're, we're completed with that item. Um, good luck with a redesign that, that accomplishes the objectives. The, we're moving on now to, um, there being no other new business, we're moving on to communications, and there are two. One is in writing and one is verbal. The first one is a communication from Town Council Michael Hill uh, regarding the request um, for an opinion on the appropriateness for the code enforcement officer to sit at the dais with the Board of Appeals. And you all have received a copy of that. Um, without rereading the whole communication, I'll, I'll summarize by saying that uh, uh, it's the town council's opinion that it, it uh, is permissible for the code enforcement officer to sit with the board um, since he is required to, by ordinance, to attend all the hearings and present to the board all the relevant factual materials. And further goes on to discuss the fact that there has not been um, a problem with that before his information and opinions have been challenged by this board before. Um, that the, given the layout of the council chambers, it doesn't seem feasible to propose um, having him sit in, a, in another place and, and therefore believes that um, there would not be an appearance of an impropriety. Um, and so it's his opinion that it is appropriate. Second communication is a verbal communication. Um, Last evening, the zoning board members were invited to a council workshop, and two, four, five of us were able to be in attendance um, about the proposed practical difficulty ordinance. Uh, it, was, it was an excellent discussion, and I really want to commend the board members for um, giving very thoughtful um, responses, as well as information, um, particularly uh, Mr. Cronin, some of your historical um, references were, I thought, very helpful, and everybody added something to the understanding of it that I, I certainly walked away with a much fuller understanding. I think we all did. Um, um, certainly with, personally, uh, with a greater commitment to, to uh, seek the support of, of the town council in, in supporting this um, to, to resolve some of the dilemmas that we're, we're continuing to be faced with. The meeting ended with um, no decisions, certainly, because it was just a workshop. There, at the June Council meeting, there will be a date set for another public hearing and then a vote. Um, so we expect it to be coming up in um, the middle of July. I don't have the exact date of the Town Council meeting, but that's when it'll be coming up. Um, we'll make sure that we get notices out so that we're all able to um, 
be in attendance. Um, I certainly encourage um, dialogue on this uh, with, um, with the citizens of Cape Elizabeth and with our elected representatives uh, to, um, to serve as resources and to, to, help, um, to help clarify the role of, of the zoning board as, as it's intended to be by the town council for the future. I don't know that we need to have any other discussion unless there's other things people would like to bring forward about it. Getting back to your first communication <clears throat> from the town attorney, Mike Hill, uh, in my professional capacity, I've had the occasion to uh, be in attendance of several other um, communities' uh, zoning board meetings, and the uh, code enforcement officer was both at, at the... Um, um, Deus. Deus. Here. What, what, what do we call this? <laughs> uh, together with the, uh, the members, the zoning members, or, um, or at a table. So it was a mixture of, of, of both. And uh, in both cases, there was an opportunity for him to sit at, or, yeah, him. No, I'll take that back, her, too. To sit uh, with the group or, or uh, down in the audience. So it was a mixture. It, and I think it's just uh, uh, tradition, what it's been in the past, uh, in the particular community. And what Bruce has been here, I don't find it offensive. Thank you. <laughs> Procedurally, uh, echoing uh, the appellant in the Armstrong case cited a court case where she said procedurally that the code enforcement officer had to present the case positively, cited a case that, so, uh, and I'm looking at our procedures, and that she had the right to cross-examine. Uh, so if that's the case, and, 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 and I didn't know, I mean, but as I'm brought a long time, I've never seen a case where we, fo we followed that procedure, but I, I'm raising the question, if that should be our procedure, is that when there's an appeal, that Bruce has to say why he ruled the way he did and then give the appellant a right to cross-examination, which is, I understand, one of the grounds for the, for the Armstrong appeal is that they were denied that. And that the, basically there were procedural errors committed. So again, I'm raising the question is, is how we should proceed when there is an appeal. You're, the question you're raising is how the code enforcement officer should present the information? Well, I'm saying that the, the way an appeal to his decision, Bruce's decision, should be conducted is according to the case of cited, that Bruce has to present his case, why he ruled as he did, and the appellant had, had, has a right to cross-examination. And uh, I've, we've never done that. I mean, I've only seen four or five appeals Maybe, I can't even think of five, I can think of four appeals and only one in which the uh, code enforcement, two in which the code enforcement officer was overruled in all the years I've been on the board. But that, if, that's, if that is in fact the case, then, then I suggest that we, we proceed that way. That if when somebody appeals Bruce's decision, his, the first procedure is to have him say why he ruled the way he did and then give the appellant the right to, cross, to present their case and to cross-examine. That to me would be, uh, eminently fair. Yeah, there's no reason why, I agree, there's no reason why we shouldn't give another party the right to ask any questions if they have any of Bruce. Um, and I don't, I don't think, think anybody's been denied that. I don't well, think I don't, anyone's I think it's incorrect that. to say that the Armstrongs were denied that opportunity, they didn't ask for it. Yeah. That's right. Um, That's correct. They weren't told that they couldn't. Um, we perhaps didn't say, do you have any questions for Bruce, but they didn't, they didn't ask to, and they certainly weren't denied the right. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no expression of any interest in doing that. As well as the fact that at that point, Bruce wasn't the decision maker, we were. Um, we, you know, Bruce presented his information and what it was based on and they presented right. their reasons for. As I recall, the, the proceedings started with you asked the Armstrong to present their case. And just the, on what they legally said that we shouldn't have done it that way, we should have. Who should have presented his case? This is in litigation. I'm not sure how much of this yeah. is. No, I'm, well, just, I'm just talking about procedures for future. I'm just saying nothing about the substance of the case, but just <laughs> procedurally in the future, how should we handle these things? I, I think those points are well taken, and I think that to the extent that we have another 
hearing in front of us, we should probably ask um, our attorney to clarify for us exactly what the roadmap what the, procedurally yeah. should be in terms of uh, who presents first, uh, who has any burden to the extent there is one of persuading us one way or the other. Uh, the town attorney was here that night of the meeting, and he. Yes. So he. Yeah. I, he didn't object to the. He never objected process, to. But we can we can certainly have another discussion with him about how we handle this kind of a situation in the future, procedurally. Yeah, I, I, it's the perception. I don't think there's any unfairness. I think it, it's the perception of unfairness that with which uh, I'd like to avoid, even to having Bruce sit down the advocates necessary. But I think it's. It lends the perception, but I, I, I grant it's not necessary. He's been overruled a couple of times. When I voted with, with the majority, when I voted against the majority, I'm not real concerned about that influencing the board unduly, but I, I am concerned with the perception uh, as cited of, of, of impropriety. Well, legally, every time we hear a variance request, legally it's an appeal for the board to overturn a decision that Bruce has already made. So. I don't think so. I, I Certainly. What? No, because they recognize the fact that they do need a variance. If they appealed his decision, if they said they didn't need a variance, that would have been an appeal of his decision. If they said they do, they recognize the fact they do need a variance, they recognize his decision. Bruce, what's the, don't, you, don't you formally deny a building permit, and that's what leads to them coming here? How does that work? I do, but it, it is based on, on the, the ordinance, so they can appeal for a variance to that if it's a variance request, or they can administratively appeal my decision based on an error that I may have made in the audience, and that would be the difference. Mm. Well, I would hope that, I think a situation like the one we're talking about here comes up very seldom, and each time it comes up, it's likely to be as different as day and night from the one before it. And I would hope that each time it happens, we will have the guidance of either Mike Hill or his successor in that council capacity. And mm -hmm. I, I'd prefer to just go along relying on that as our, as our set of guidance. And certainly the reason why Mike Hill was here was because it was a complicated case. And he was here for in case there was legal guidance that was needed for us as well as for the process. Um, and I think we need to continue to rely on him for those kinds of cases. I do agree with Bob's point that we should do everything we can to project and live with a sense of fairness to the applicant. We don't want the applicant to see an appearance of, of unfairness. We want to try to do whatever we can consciously and positively to dispel that. I really don't, my own personal opinion, Bruce sitting where he is has no impact on that. Bruce does not try to counsel the board privately during a meeting. Um, he's separated by one seat from that anyway. Um, well, I have the secretary over here. Right. I, I, I would also add that I, I have observed that the behavior of the board um, makes it very clear that we, we um, consider, bend over backwards to consider all evidence from the applicant. Yeah. Then as far as we can without breaking. Yeah. In some cases, another procedural manner we had talked about having, uh, I, following the planning board's precedent, that the first thing they do is have a vote that the application is complete. Look at this application tonight. I see number five is not answered. Not that it's necessary. I see that uh, there's no place where the exact amount of variance being asked for occurs in this application, and I have trouble making sense out of out of what seven says specifically says state specifically the changes proposed for reasons such changes are necessary uh, i was looking here to get the exact amount of, of variance being asked for and i don't even see it on this application so, uh, i would propose that one of the first things we consider is whether or not the application is complete that all questions are answered and the exact variance asked for is clearly specified which this doesn't do. Well, it would be nice if the application wasn't complete that the applicant be told that before they got in front of mm -hmm. this board. Mm -hmm. You can only do so much for an applicant. You right. can hold a hand and you can walk through it and you can tell them to answer every question and you can review it. 
but if they don't want to do it, for whatever reason, they won't do it. And it's a very frustrating process dealing with, with, with some applicants because they don't want to listen. Some do, and it's, it's fine. But a good many times, you can beat your head against the wall and still not get anywhere. So if the board, at that point, the board wants to table it and tell them to go away until they complete, that's fine with me. Uh, Bruce, I do you do so much? Do you then support Bob's comments on on uh, this board reviewing an application and and whether it's complete or not? If there's information that that seems to be lacking, uh, if it's table it. If it's, it's pertinent information to your decision, I think you have every right to send the applicant away. If it's not as not pertinent, you can still make a decision. See, then I'm not so sure that that's uh, th my, that would be warranted. My only concern. Or one of my concerns would be um, the number of people that might be in attendance to hear an issue, and we vote to uh, table it, and they all go home until next month. Uh, we advertise it. We invite people to to make public comments at that particular time, and uh, it probably would be pretty frustrating uh, for these people to come to be in attendance and uh, then be sent home. Uh, I do believe a lot of these applications uh, were lacking information. I've been saying that for, what, five years? Um, and I certainly would like to see uh, some of those blanks filled in. Bob, I, I am a strong advocate for, for a, a, a You ought an to see me on a, on a Wednesday when I get the applications on Tuesday night calling people the next day because the measurements aren't even on the plans. And well, and I, would, I would like to see. Get it in the paper for Thursday. Yeah. I'd like to see you make an executive decision, if that's possible, and just send it back with, Tell with, them it'll wait a month with our support and just say, we will not accept it and don't advertise it. I know, I know you might be handcuffed and, and, and limited as to what you can do, but we don't like to see some of these before us with, with a lot of these blanks. I try to work with them and, and get, get the request to be heard as in a timely fashion. The, the, I think the law states that they have to be heard within 30 days on a variance appeal. I may be wrong on that, but... Um. I think that's an outdated uh, law, too, because uh, I think a lot of times they were, they were meeting two, two times a month, uh, and it just can't happen if you're only meeting once a month to, to have, have the... Uh, I have a process uh, suggestion, and that is that we again talk with uh, Mike Hill about this. There's another request that we had of him to get us language that we're waiting for that has to do with, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but it had to do with uh, Proceed. notify, procedurally notifying them, the applicant, that they had to get it to us by a certain deadline or it wouldn't be heard. And this is in the same general um, subject area. That's fine with me. I think if the board feels that, that you want to refuse on my level or your level, uh, when it gets to you that it's incomplete and send them away. I don't know that that, that that Mike Hill has to confirm that is the way it has to be, other than the time frame. Actually, it had, to do, it, had to, it, had, it had to do with the time frame and the receipt of information that we didn't want to be receiving um, thick packets of information at this meeting on something. We wanted it in advance. And so we're still waiting for language from him. I'll, in between meetings, I'll this in the next meeting, I'll have a discussion with him and ask him to come forward with a um, language and a recommendation, and Bruce should be part of those discussions. Something for us to, to consider, and then we can have a discussion about it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But I agree with Joe. The last thing we want to do is be sending applicants um, and either interested supporting witnesses or remonstrators right. away because there is something in the application that isn't complete, especially if it's information that we can get by asking a few questions of right. whoever's here with us. I mean, there's, we don't want to be overly fastidious about the rigors of filling out an application. But I agree with you, Joe, that if there's information that we need that can't be provided simply by asking a few questions because measurements need to be taken that aren't on there, then that's perfectly appropriate to say, I'm sorry, we can't hear it tonight. The lacking information hasn't been as evident as, say, a year ago. 
uh, and Bob can attest to this, a lot of information was needed uh, a year or two ago and we didn't receive it. Uh, it seems as though the load is certainly lighter and the requests aren't as, as, uh, as difficult to, to, uh, to, to judge or to rule on um, in the last year. Well, was that a fair assessment? Uh, but previous to that, there were some real tough ones and there was lacking information we really, we really needed. Uh, I find it especially frustrating when they don't specify the setback being requested. I, I, I figured it out from, from, from Bruce's denial notice, but uh, there's nothing on this that says what's being asked for. And it, the zone is not specified. I had to look up what zone this property was in to figure out what the setback should be. Uh, and I'm saying, is there a typo on number seven there, Bruce? Specifically state that changes proposed, it should be and reasons for changes? Proposed for reasons? I, I, I don't know what that means. Number seven. It's probably or instead of for. What would you, that would be or? State specifically the changes proposed or reasons, okay. such changes and. are necessary. Maybe and? This is one or form I haven't, I haven't uh, done over. I've done a majority of the forms over since I took over three years ago. This form I have not mm. touched. This was the form that was it's being like used prior. Mm. I never noticed that before. That should be corrected. Okay. Maybe it should be and. I think it should be and. And again, he, did, he, he didn't specify exactly what changes he wanted or why they were necessary. So it probably should be and instead of for. Mm. Does that come from ordinance language? I don't believe so. No. Okay. Bruce, do you have the authority to tell an applicant the application is incomplete and have to wait another month? There again, I we probably got to check with the town attorney, but the variance appeal, if they pay their fee, you kind of got to put them on the board. That's what I thought, yeah. yeah. It, on the agenda. I mean, you can't, yeah. you can't deny that opportunity, I don't believe, under state law, whether the application is filled out entirely or, or not at all. Right. And, I mean, we can get an opinion from Mike Hill, but I don't believe that you can turn him away. Can so we as have a, have can a right to a, a, a fair uh, hearing in a reasonable time frame. Can we as a board turn them away for... You can, you can, you can table the application uh, pending okay. information that's pertinent to you to whatever decision you might render. Of course. Uh, I, 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 I think Bob's point's a good point. I mean, this application is missing some key information. We can get it easily here, but I think we'd like to try to have this process be done a little better. I don't think the information that's missing was that hard for the applicant to provide, so it's not, not a question of a difficult application. Questions are there. Yeah, I know. I always yeah. tell them when they talk to me, they got they to answer the questions, all of them, and then they read. It's not an easy thing. Do we have a bottle Especially when, when you have five, and they all come in. They all come in on Tuesday afternoon. I mean, they do, and we have to have everything ready for the paper Thursday morning. Yeah. Um, it's 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 frustrating. It's always been that way with every town I work with. Uh, for some reason, it's just it, it's like pulling teeth. Do we have a sample application about what it what it should look like when it's completed? That might help. The other question I have is is a. Uh, I guess I wasn't fully clear that we were waiting for Mike Kill in terms of adopting procedures for ensuring that we get all the information before the meeting. Isn't we, that a we, we had requested um, him to draft something, and yeah. I reminded him of that in my conversation yeah. this past month. We just haven't seen it yet. Is that something we just adopt ourselves without, like, I mean, it's a simple thing. The applicant must get the full application in before so-and-so. Written information but provided after that, they won't be considered. I mean, si since it's a procedural policy that we'd adopt, why don't we make sure okay. it's just drafted so that well it's, I just it's been dragging on for so long I'm getting impatient with it and I'd like to see it consummated I'll, I'll convey that to you because that's been since last year we've been talking about this, so. and I think that it came to a head with this one case where we got this pile this thick mm -hmm. but um, it could happen again next month and came ahead what this one case a couple of months ago with an applicant came in on Tuesday night with a pile of documentation this thick that we hadn't seen before. Right. That was what prompted this board, and if we look back in the minutes, we'll see it, that yeah. we, we wanted the town council yeah. to draft something. Yeah. So why don't we make sure that it's on the agenda? Yeah. 
for next time. I think we have the right to develop procedures to implement the law. I think that it's true of any agency of the state. The state is, is mandated to do X, and then the agency uh, establishes its own procedures to, de to, to execute the, the law. So uh, I'd like to be in for Mike, but I think it's probably worthwhile us drafting uh, uh, some notices like you, your application will have to, if it's not complete, you may be, it may be tabled. Uh, and please make sure you fill out everything that's, uh, and maybe even offer them as a sample about what, what an application should look like. We have, we have a cover letter that goes with it. It explains that you have to have 10 copies. You have to pay $75. It has to be in Tuesday, two weeks prior to the meeting, the meetings on the fourth Tuesday, that all questions have to be answered, that a site plan has to be drawn, that a mortgage inspection plan has to be submitted. They have all that information in front of them. Attached to the application is the front cover letter. So they do have most of that in place, or they have it all in place. It's just a matter of getting them to do that to the application. <laughs> I mean, they, that is in place. It's, if you came up to the office, we'll give you one of them. If you read it and pay attention to it, and you're anyone there intelligent, I think you could probably fill it out. Can you, can you put copies of that in next month's packet for us? And we'd also talked about having a sketch plan as opposed to a request e survey. Has that, have we thought about that at all? Or Excuse me? Thought about having a sketch plan be required to be submitted as opposed to a request e survey? And we've been that road just not too long ago. What? what? The council so the, said no. Oh, oh, the council has a right to do that? Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't, the board as a whole didn't want to take, make that decision, so we took it to the council, and the council basically said that. Sketch plan's nice, but you're telling us that sometimes a survey may be required and we don't want to impose that kind of hardship on an applicant. So that, that went nowhere. That's why we're still just doing the mortgage inspection, which is not an accurate document. Now you were, you were on the board. We went through that route. Yes, and we also had a presentation of what a sketch plan looked like and the cost, and I thought it was reasonable. Right. Again, we're looking at, at scary numbers on these additions, and a $500 bill is, is, is minor when you're talking uh, the possibility of spending that kind of money and being out of the footprint, out of, out of the building envelope. Sketch plan is about 450 bucks, but the problem the council had was the fact that the only time that a, a, a survey and outfit will do a sketch plan and sign off that the that the thing is accurate is if they have enough information to to be comfortable with that. And when they don't have that, then the applicant has to do a survey. So the board felt the council felt that at times, if a survey is needed, that we shouldn't impose a hardship of a thousand dollars and up on an applicant uh, to get what the board needs. And therefore, they didn't they weren't even comfortable doing the sketch plan. If everybody could have had a sketch plan done then probably there wouldn't have been a problem. Well, there's, there were still some problems. I wouldn't, I'm not sure if it would pass or not, but it was more the issue that, that the next step is too costly. And we went, Henry and I just, uh, att uh, went, attended several workshops on this, and you know we brought it right to the line, and we finally just backed off because they weren't receptive. Because we found it quite frustrating that we weren't even requiring mortgage inspection plans. And then we started requ we requiring them, but not a, not, there's not a survey around that will, that will sign off on a mortgage inspection plan. In fact, he puts on a mortgage inspection plan that this is not to be used for anything but to tell the bank that, it, that it's not in violation of current setbacks. I mean, they put it right on it. They put a disclaimer right on it, so. Um, but. I guess it's better than a napkin drawer. Maybe. <laughs> well, we did make some headway. <laughs> well, all right. snail space, but we did Couldn't make. Convince them we did the need for that. Well, this has certainly been um, a full communication section. <laughs> um, any other business before we close? There being none, I declare this meeting adjourned until the next one. Bruce, is the backlog building up? What's that? Backlog building up, waiting for a...
change yeah, in the... Uh, well, and, uh, not really building up. Uh, you, you, you can't find a the builder these days. I really think that Bruce probably doesn't have the authority to deny.